You'd think I would remember by now. Uh, the, the lesson tonight, it, the, you, we just don't have a lot left. I mean, there's just not a lot left. So we'll go through Philemon through June, Jude tonight. Um, I think it's like, how many slides is it, Doug? 12, maybe? 13 total, and that's like the inner. Yeah, it's like the introductory slides too. So there's there's just not a lot to go through. And next week, um, you can ask me whatever questions you want to ask me about Revelation, and I'm going to give you a basic explanation. That's that's all I'm going to give you. Oh, by the way, online or not online people, but uh, Facebook people, tonight's presentation. If you go to Kingdom's website. The actual presentation is uploaded, so you can see the presentation on there as well. Um, and that way, if you want to follow along with the presentation, I just can't stream it on Facebook. I can only stream it on WebEx. So, anyways, um, but I'll give you a basic explanation next week. But you know, you can't like you're going to teach the entire book of Revelation in, in an hour. You can't do it. I mean, you just can't do it. So I'll give you a basic explanation. So here's the deal with my mom. Got all of her scans back. She still has a tumor. Uh, it did not grow. It is not in her lymph nodes. It has not metastasized. Um, they do believe they can get everything with the surgery. Um, but she's going to have some lifelong stuff. We'll just leave it at that. That she'll have to deal with with the rest of her life. Um, not what she wanted, but deal with that, you know, um, because of the work they have to do with her gastrointestinal tract. I'd rather have her alive and dealing with that than not alive. So my mom will have to, and there's no reversing it. What it is, it is, it is for the rest of her life. Um, so. Just pray about that. Maybe they open her up and God has worked a great miracle. But that is next Wednesday. So some of you are saying you're teaching Bible study next Wednesday. I will be there all day unless something goes horribly wrong, which is not going to happen. I mean, possible, but not probable. The doctors are super hopeful about all this. Um, I will be here. Uh, if I'm not, I'll let you know. And if I'm not, we'll figure it out. You know what I mean? I'll do a video or something, but I should be here. My older sister Keely is coming in next Tuesday. Um, I don't think my brother will be in from Baltimore. Just, I just don't think he will. I, Nick, <laughs> Nick's, Nick's like the family ninja. He comes in and out. And we're like, when did Nick get here? Where did Nick go? <laughs> I mean, it's just crazy. He's like in and out and it's just so weird. Um, but they have assured us they'll be here for Christmas, but <laughs> I'm not holding my breath on that one either. Oh my gosh, that brother. Anyways, and then my sister Carrie has to work actually next Wednesday, but she'll be there the next day. So my plan is, is to be there all day. I'm going to lead prayer. We're praying with her Tuesday. I'm going to lead prayer Wednesday morning, go to the hospital, be there all day with my dad, my older sister, and then I'll come back here and teach and then I'll do my duty. Um, the next day, but I've kind of shut everything down at church. I've gotten all my stuff done. Like I planned out the entire year next year over these last three days. So I've got everything planned. I know what the preaching schedule is. If West Virginia would ever release their football schedule, I could plan next fall completely. Um, but we're, we're ready to go. Um, so I'm not going to meet with anybody except like emergency people between now and the end of the year, because we just need to be there for my mom, because it's a six week recovery. So, you know, I mean, it's what we expected, but it'll be good, you know, because she'll, she'll, she'll be mom again, because it's been a couple of years. We never knew what it was. And then finally, we were able to get in and, you know, trying to get your sister in, but I'm banging my, yeah, banging my head against the wall a little bit here, but I'm, I'm, I'm working on it. I'll get it. I'll do the best I can. It's like it's like working magic because you can't get in there. It's crazy. Pastor James can't get in, and, and Tanya works at the Dagon Hospital. You know, I mean, it's just nuts. So, anyways, all right, there we go. So, 
Uh, all right, nice people online. I'm gonna share my screen. Keynote. Show me in front of presentation. Share. I don't know what just happened there. There I am. Okay. All right. If you cannot see online, somebody text me or something. Um, Matthew, you're on Facebook too. Can you can you see the presentation and hear me also? Somebody just let me know, please. Someone. Someone. Anyone? Bueller. Bueller. He's sick. <laughs> Okay, Jackie, you can see me. Okay, I'm I'm talking on WebEx is what I'm talking on. Matthew, you're on both. That's why I said that. So, all right. So tonight, Philemon through Jude. Okay, on face on Facebook, you can only see me. <laughs> I swear to you, next year, Sharon, it's all your fault. I could have just gone straight video, but now I have to do this in house next year. No, I'm teasing. Okay. All right. You can, you can hear both and you can see you. Okay. Very good. All right. That's enough. Oh, I jumped too far. Okay. All right. You know what? Pray. Father, we love you. Thank you. <laughs> you know, um, I love teaching this class. Um, I, I don't think I thought, honestly, Lord, I thought Byron was pretty smart till tonight, but the fact that he said I could get an IT job after this, I don't think that's true, God. <laughs> I'm not very good at this stuff, but uh, it's so nice that so many people can join us online and on Facebook and in this room. I'm so happy that so many people have stuck with this this year. It's so great to look every day and see the daily devotional and see there's like between three and 500 people every day, Lord, studying the word, looking at all of the daily reading sheets and seeing how much went into all of that, Lord God, you know, like 1500 pages. It's amazing that so many people are studying your word and I couldn't be more excited about it. So as we go through these last two weeks, I just pray God that um, your blessing is on each and every one of these people. And when we get here next week and we finish um, the study after being done for a couple of days with the reading, Lord, um, we will have made it again. Every time we make it through, I just think about that passage from Ezekiel, eat the scroll, eat the scroll, eat the scroll, eat the scroll. How exciting that is that time after time and day after day, that that's what we get to do, eat the scroll. So God bless us here this evening as we work through Philemon, through Jude. Teach us tonight, Holy Spirit. We love and give you praise. It's in your precious name that we pray, Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, Facebook friends. <laughs> Ellie, who's sitting right there, just typed in, I'm in-house and I see you. Smart Alec. <laughs> okay. All right. Let's go to the book of Philemon, and it's short, so we can go through the whole thing. So I love, I love to read. It was funny. Um, GMB Mary Rose's grandson signed his national letter of intent today to play at Akron. He's going to play Division I basketball at Akron. So we were over there for that today to cheer Sharon on. And it was funny, Sue. We went to high school together. When I went into the office, you, you now have to get a visitor's sticker. And it said on the sticker, Kevin Kane Library was where I was going. And I said, well, when I was at Morgantown High, I can honestly tell you, no one ever found me in the library. <laughs> you know, but I love to read now. I love to read. I love to look at the intricacy of, of books and, and especially the scripture. And Philemon is one of those books. It just is. Philemon is one of those books. And you, okay, tone is important. So I say in the prayer, I used to think Byron was smart. He could get up and walk out now thinking, gosh, why would Kevin say that about me? Well, you get the tone of what I'm saying. There's a tone to the book of Philemon. And you, 
you are wise to pick up on the tone. Paul is being about as kind as he can be. But if you don't get just the undertone of this book, this letter, then you don't, like people use this as a justification for slavery. And then you don't understand what Paul is saying. Like right out of the chute. I mean, you know, Facebook folks, just open to Philemon, I'm reading the whole thing, okay? Look at how it begins. He's writing to a slave owner. And, and listen, people will say, well, it's indentured servanthood. I don't care if it's indentured servanthood. Did you read the second chapter of the book of Acts? There is no indentured servanthood in the body of Christ. Did you read the book of Nehemiah? Do you remember when Nehemiah comes back and he says, you're doing what to your own people? No, 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 no. This is not how we do things. So when, when Paul is writing to Philemon, it doesn't matter if it's slavery in the sense of what we know, or this guy's working for Philemon in, a, you know, in the role of an indentured servant. It doesn't matter. It is equality, not just equity, okay? I heard Mike Tomlin talking about this. He said, equality is everyone is equal. He said, equity is we treat everyone the same, but not everyone is equal. We don't treat the third string quarterback or people on the practice squad like we treat the first string quarterback and the starters. Do you see what I'm saying? That's equity. The, bo the body of Christ is not about equity. It's about equality. And so you have to come at the book of Philemon from that context. This is about equality, oneness, unity. Now watch what Paul says. Paul a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our dear friend and fellow worker. <laughs> Are you picking up? Also, to Apphia, our sister, and Archippus, our fellow soldier. Look at that next line. And to the church that meets in your home. Buddy, you're running a church out of your house. Of all the people should understand how this thing's working is you. You've got a church in your home. And your church in your home should reflect the body of Christ as a whole. And yet you're running a slavery operation up in here? Uh-uh. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I always thank my God as I remember you in my prayers. Now, remember, this is Paul, who's a prisoner of Christ Jesus. And, and he, 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 some people think he was a prisoner in Rome when he wrote this. If not, he was close. I always thank my God as I remember you in my prayers. Why? Because I hear about your love for all his holy people and your faith in the Lord Jesus. You love everybody, just not Onesimus. I pray that your partnership with us is in the faith, us in the faith may be effective in deepening your understanding of every good thing we share for the sake of Christ. Your love has given me great joy and encouragement. Why? Well, because you, brother, have refreshed the hearts of the Lord's people. And because of all of this, therefore, although in Christ I could be bold, and order you to do what you ought to do. Don't forget who's writing you this letter. It is Paul. And don't forget that while there is no hierarchy within the church, I am the Apostle Paul. I could tell you to do what you ought to do, yet I prefer to appeal to you on the basis of love. It says none other than Paul, an old man and now also a prisoner of Christ Jesus, that I appeal to you from my son Onesimus, who became my son while I was in chains. Now, formerly he was useless to you, but now he has become useful both to you and to me. I am sending him, who is my very heart, back to you. 
I would have liked to keep him with me so that he could take your place in helping me while I'm in chains for the gospel. You already say it? You didn't step up to the plate. You didn't come here and be my sidekick while I'm bound in chains. No, you're sitting back where you are sitting in your little house church with your hierarchical ways. But I didn't want to do anything without your consent. So that any favor you would not see, so any favor you do would not seem forced, but would be voluntary. Perhaps the reason that Onesimus was separated from you for a little while was that you might have him back forever. No longer a slave, but better than a slave, as a dear brother. He is very dear to me, but even dear to you, both as a fellow man. I mean, think about that. He's appealing to him just on the basis of one human being to another. No one human being should ever lord over another human being, but that's the way of the world. So even if you're moral, Philemon, you should treat him with equality, or at least equity, and as a brother as in the Lord. We do things differently. So if you consider me a partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. If he's done you any wrong or owes you anything, charge it to me. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will pay it back. Not to mention that you owe me your very self. <laughs> I do wish, brother, that I may have some benefit from you and the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience. I write to you, knowing that you will do even more than I ask. Oh, and one more thing. Prepare a guest room for me, because I hope to be restored to you in answer to your prayers. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, we're up to three now, sends you greetings. Oh, and by the way, so do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. <laughs> I think he made his point. <laughs> Onesimus was carrying, he was one of the ones that were carrying the um, offering for the church at Jerusalem. That's how he ended up with Paul. But apparently something went haywire when he was with Philemon, and he, he ran because of Philemon's treatment of him. You have to kind of put the pieces together with the reading. Um, but that's what's happened here. And so there's no way of us knowing what happened afterwards. I mean, there's some church history and stuff that you can look at, but there's nothing else in, in the canon of Scripture that says whether or not Philemon welcomed him or not. But you get the point that Paul is making. If we're going to do this thing within the body of Christ, then we're all going to do it together, or we're not going to do it at all. And I think that's why we have to look at this today, you know, again. So, so watch this. I literally went through all the services today that will be held at Kingdom next year, okay? And plotted the whole thing out. And it was like a, talk about an algorithm. We pl I plotted everything out so that Daniel gets 25 preaching opportunities next year. I get 25 preaching opportunities next year. See what I'm saying? We, we, the book of Philemon tells us equality, equality, equality all the time, okay? And we take that very, very seriously around here. Um, so that's that. All right, any questions in the room on the book of Philemon? Pretty powerful book. All right, next thing. So I put this up here, and I'm leaving it up here. I could have changed the slide, but I chose to keep it in here because last year at this time when I taught this lesson, hard to believe, we were still on the edges of COVID. We just were. And it was interesting because it was one of the hardest fights we had to fight was to get people back in this room. And I think you all know this, that everything has changed after COVID. And because of technology, everything has changed. It's why I'm fumbling up here. 
I mean, I really don't know what I'm doing with any of this technology. You know, we were laughing this morning. If, if you weren't watching morning prayer, we were laughing this morning because I couldn't get anything to work. I mean, I was late anyway. I mean, I wasn't late, but I was late and I, I couldn't get anything to work, you know, and then it kicked off and then I was frustrated and had to get my act together in order to pray. And it was just, it was a mess. It was just so much easier when Bible study was on Wednesday and everybody just showed up. But that changed. COVID and technology changed everything. Gerard Gunter, who spoke at Refuge the other night, he said, um, up until last year, just because of where they were in Memphis, they still were closed up to a year ago, which boggles my mind. And I've said this many times, we never broke a single rule, never, not a single rule. You talk about a COVID czar, Pastor James was our COVID czar. He just was, man, that brother, whoo, he is serious about washing his hands. I mean, me, I worked at the machine shop all those years, so I was like, well, I don't care, whatever, you know? So we were on totally opposite end of the spectrum. So when we were trying to figure out the policies, don't ask me. I was the wrong guy to ask. You always have to err on the side. I mean, it goes back to Philemon, you know, it wasn't a matter of faith. It was, it was a matter of where we should go. But, you know, we did everything in the building as we were supposed to be doing, but the doors were open every single week. I mean, the grocery stores were open. I'm not closing the church doors if the grocery stores are open. I remember what Miss Sarah told me. She said, you better not close that church. And I said, I have no intention. I'm just telling you right now. You close that church out, it's straight from the pits of hell. And I said, it'll be open. Stop yelling at me. I mean, it was crazy. Nobody came. I mean, nobody was here. I mean, we were 97 feet apart from each other up on the platform. And, uh, you know, I mean, there was no chairs left in the room. It was nuts. Um, but we did what we had to do. But the church was always open. So kingdom, and I'm not saying we're better. This isn't one of these. We never were closed. We were open the entire time. We never closed the doors. And people started to figure that out. And they found their way in the building. And they still had to socially distance. They still had to wear their mask. We never made Miss Sarah wear a mask. <laughs> she, she was exempt from everything. But, you know, I mean, I, I said, could you please? And she told me no. And I said, okay. And that's just how it went. You know, I'm not going to argue with her. You know, but we did what we were asked to do. And I'm not trying to be flippant about that. You know, we followed every single rule. We had, if you guys know Josh Manzi, um, Josh was a math major at WVU. And I said, listen, I got a job for you. And he said, what's my job? I said, I need you. And I was serious about this. I'm not joking around. I said, I want you to come into this room. And I said, I want you to do a massive word problem. And he said, what are you talking about? I said, I need you to come into this room. I need you to measure every single bit of it in relation to the COVID rules. And I need you to get as many chairs into this room as possible. And I also need you to look at the amount of families that come to the room, or, you know, on a normal basis, you know, which, which household has one, which household has four, which household has six. I need you to do a complete math problem so that we are 100% within the rules and we're able to put the maximum number of people in this room and never violate a law. And he did. He came in here, he measured everything, the width of the chairs. I mean, that equation was crazy that he put together and it was together and it was 100% within the rules that the government laid out. And it was amazing. And we just, you know, I mean, it was amazing. And so we took this passage of scripture very seriously from Hebrews. And I know there's a thousand things I could teach out of Hebrews tonight, but I'm just, I'm telling you, Therefore, uh, those of you that are on Facebook, yeah, I'm in Hebrews 10, 19 through uh, 25. Hebrews 10, 19 to 25. And honestly, Sharon, I'm not trying to be snippy about this, but this, this, is, this is the scripture you gave me, you know? And, you know, thanks. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, open for us through the curtain, that is his body, and since we have a great high priest, a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart 
and with full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope that we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And then here it is. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. And, you know, I do think it's important. I think it's important that we're in the room, and I think it's important that we utilize technology. Um, as much as I want to spend my evenings at home, um, not teaching in the building um, with the technology platform that we have would be doing a disservice. It would be violating this, this passage of scripture. And so, you know, Facebook is going away at the beginning of the year. Um, not, not, I'm talking about for Bible study, okay? It's not going away. WebEx is going away. So we're not gonna stream on Facebook. We're not gonna stream on WebEx. We're gonna stream on this platform that we stream on Sunday mornings because it's set up to do that, okay? So we will set up on, on Wednesday nights and we'll stream online like we stream online for Sunday morning and there'll be a proctor up there who will take the questions. So we can ask questions. Um, and so we'll teach the gospels. I think it starts, I wanna say it starts January 12th. I'll, I'll let you know next week for sure. But it, it starts that, that second Wednesday in the new year and, and we'll, we'll go 12 weeks on that. Um, and then we'll start up again at the end. It's the, it's literally the last Wednesday of July. It's July 31st, and we'll we'll do 12 weeks in uh, Paul and um, and uh, Acts in all of Paul's letters. Um, you know, and so we need to be in house because it's just it's just super super important. What was your question? Second Wednesday of January, whatever that date is. I'm not sure. It's the 10th. Okay, so we start then January 10th is when we'll start. Huh? 12 weeks. Yeah. I'll have everything laid out for you next week, where to get the book and all of that. You can just use your Bible, but it, it kind of helps to have the book that I'm teaching out of. It's, it's the harmonized book. Um, so we'll, we'll just go through that at the beginning of the year. But anyways, it's, it's important for all of us to be together. Let me use another example. So I was a hardliner when it came to morning prayer. I thought we were violating something in terms of morning prayer if we were to stream. And I said no a thousand times. And I mean, you were here, Ryan, the first morning I did it. Um, I just thought, you know what, I'm doing this thing. When, when I logged off yesterday morning, okay? Not today, because I screwed it up today. But when I logged off yesterday morning, in the one hour that we were outside to inside, do you know how many people had joined us? 181 people. That's powerful. So to not utilize that technology, in that case, I don't think, well, it would, it would be wrong. And to use that technology in that, I don't think it's a violation of this scripture. You know, I mean, I don't want you to think that I felt condemned, or, but you were right. And I hadn't thought about it until you sent it. I knew it, but I hadn't thought about it in that way. And shame on me for, you know, not thinking about it in those terms. But you were right about that. We need to be in this place together studying the Bible. I told them that at, at, at staff meeting, I think last week or the week before. I mean, you look around this room, there's 30 people in this room. We've got 21 online there. I'm not quite sure how many people are on WebEx, you know. But think about that. If the national average for churches is 75, we have that in a Bible study. And it was funny, my friend, Evan Witters, who's one of the assistant provosts at WVU, and I think I might have said this a couple of weeks ago, we were talking about kingdom and the commitment that it takes. It's not like our Bible study is easy. Like we studied the entire Bible in a year. 
The reading requirement is ridiculous to be part of this Bible study. It just is, you know? And so I love the fact that we have, you know, 60, 70 people in our Bible study literally happening right now. You know what I'm saying? So we have to find that balance in this world now between what is the welcoming of technology and what is holding to the truth of the scripture, which says we've got to keep meeting with one another because we're becoming more and more and more and more divided as a people. And we just, we don't know who, who one another, you know, are anymore. We just don't. So we're going to keep this going. Again, there's about 7 million things. Um, there's about 7 million things that we could do um, to, to teach this book of Hebrews. But I, I wanted to stay there for now. If we do another, we, we went through the entire book of Hebrews a couple of years ago. I just wanted to land on that here tonight and, and address that, that we're going to continue to grow with technology, but we're not going to stop meeting in this room. So there's Hebrews. All right. Book of James. Let's talk about faith and works, okay? So if you're watching online, um, so I see this on Facebook. Kurt, if you will private message me, I will get in, you in touch with, um, with the local pantries in town. They are well equipped to uh, meet needs. So message me privately and uh, I'll get you squared away. There you go. Um, James 2, those of you that are online, James 2, verses 14 through 16. So here's what I want you to see when we're talking about faith and works. It's, it's not linear. Do you know what I mean by that? I say it's not linear. It's not like if you have faith, the next step is works. That's not what it is. They kind of coexist together. When there is faith in your heart, because there is faith in your heart, the natural flow works, okay? Jesus says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, okay? Whatever is in there is going to come out of you, all right? Um, Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. For by grace you have been saved through faith, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. So what Paul is saying to the church at Ephesus there is this. He's saying the natural flow of faith is work. And if you're working for God, they're just turning lights off over there. You've got another small group that's meeting over there. When you have faith in God, those works will flow. And if you are doing those works in the name of Christ, genuinely, it's because faith is present. They, it, it's, it's not this is results in this. It's just when this is present, this is present also. You can't have faith without works, and you can't have works without faith. They're both present. How we come to faith is the work of God, okay? That's the work of God in our life, and we surrender over to that, but once we find ourselves in the midst of faith, we also find ourselves in the midst of works. Does that make sense? When you find yourself in the midst of faith, you also find yourself in the midst of works that glorify God. When you find yourself in the midst of works that glorify God, it's because you're also in the midst of faith. It's both, all right? This is how Jesus' half-brother, some of you are like, whoa, what? Jesus' half-brother? Well, Joseph and Mary had children after that, okay? He, she was pure until she bore Christ, but after that, they had a husband and wife relationship and had more babies, okay? James writes, James 2, 14 through 26. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Well, suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. 
If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it's not accompanied by action, is dead. Okay? I mean, look what I wrote there in the note. Actually, death results in such false claims of faith. Woo! But someone will say, well, you have faith, I have deeds. It's not like wonder twin powers activate. That's not what it is. Okay? Show me your faith without deeds, and I'll show you my faith by my deeds. Okay, you see that? If I have trusted in God, in God's grace, then deeds will flow. If you don't see deeds, then clearly you haven't trusted in faith. Look what Paul is saying there. Okay? Show me your faith without your deeds. That's not possible. And I'll show you my faith by my deeds. No one gains grace, the grace of God, because of the works that they do. Nobody died on the cross. Jesus died on the cross. You see what I'm saying? So you can't good deed yourself into the grace of God. It's the grace of God that draws you into the grace of God when you're submissive to the grace of God, and faith and deeds are both present at the exact same time. Hope that makes sense, okay? You believe that there's one God? Well, that's good. Even the demons believe that, and they shudder. You foolish person, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together. His faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness and he was called God's friend. You see that a person is not considered righteous by what they do and not by faith alone. It's, it's, it's a union. In the same way was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction. As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. See, Rahab had to say, I'm not putting my faith in the ways of Jericho anymore. I'm putting my faith in the one true and living God. And it's telling, and I find this interesting, because her house, it says, was in the wall. It was in the wall of Jericho. What happened to the walls of Jericho? Except for Rahab's house. How cool is that? You talk about a statement of faith. You've got this red cord, this scarlet cord flying out of her window, and they're marching, and all of a sudden, do do do, do the trumpets go off, and the, all the walls fall down, except for one house. And there it stands. It stands as a sentinel of her faith. Did she hide the spies? Yes. Did that produce her faith? No. Did she have faith in the Lord? Yes. And the faith in the Lord is evidenced in the fact that she hid the spies. Do you see what I'm saying? Faith and works working together. And I know I'm opening up a can of worms here. Faith and works working together when it came to Abraham. Okay? Abraham's final test was God didn't tempt Abraham to sin. God doesn't tempt us to sin. But there are plenty of places in the scripture, and this, boy, you talk about a lesson that we had long ago. This was probably back in February, maybe in January. Abraham's last test is this. I took you out of a pagan people who satisfied the gods by sacrificing their oldest son. That's what I took you out of. I am saying to you, I want you to go up on Mount Moriah and sacrifice your oldest son. What? There are lots of times where God will say, I want you to do what I know, you know, I would never ask you to do. To see if you will go the distance and trust that when it gets to the finish line, 
you'll never be asked to do what I'm asking you to do. I know I'm talking in riddles here. And this is why Abraham says to his servants, oh, the boy and I are going up there and we're worshiping and we will come back to you. It wasn't I, it was we. And even in the book of Hebrews, it says that Abraham had even reckoned in himself, even if this boy dies, God's going to resurrect him from the dead. They're on the way up the mountain. Son says to father, uh, dad, we got wood and fire and a knife. But we do not have a sacrifice. And Abraham wasn't lying to Isaac. He said, God will provide the sacrifice. And sure enough, that's what happens. It's faith that God would provide, and I will walk the distance because I know at some point God will stop me. Same thing happened with Moses. Get out of the way, Moses. I'm going to kill them all. And Moses went, no. Now that's not right. You kill me and save them. And God says, you get an A. That was the answer. You have answered correctly. How about this one? God says to David at the end of David's life, you know what I need you to do? I need you to count all your troops and see just how great you are. And David said, I think that's a great idea. That was a bad idea. What God was asking him to do was stand in the faith that he knew to be true. It wasn't to sin. I know a lot of people would say, gosh, Kevin, you're splitting hairs there. No, it's the ultimate test of faith. We have to say to God, now wait a second, that ain't quite right. And God will say, that's very good. Jesus saying to the disciples in the upper room, if you've got a sword, make sure you got it on you. And they go, we've got two swords. And Jesus says, oh my gosh, that's enough. How do we know that he said it like that? Because when they're in the Garden of Gethsemane, what does he say to Simon Peter? Put it away! They don't get the message. You see, they don't get the message. So this is one of these instances that he's talking about here in terms of Abraham. And so in our lives, this is why I was saying a couple of weeks ago at church, we have to know the complete story of the scripture. We have to know the complete theme of the scripture. Because when we do... We will know how God lives and moves and has his being. And when anything is contrary to that, we can say, now, wait a second, God. That is not of you. I'm not walking in that direction. Very good. Stay with me just as you are. That's hard, but it's true. Okay? So faith and works are one thing. They come together. All right? Here we go. 1 Peter 5.8. Now, if you guys are on Facebook, uh, I'm also going to draw your attention to Luke 22, verses 31 and 32. Okay? I know you can't see that, but if you're, you're on Facebook, um, just kind of mark 1 Peter 5, 8 to 11 and Mark, Luke 22, 31, and 32. Let's deal with 1 Peter 5, 8 through 11. So when my boys were little, they went to shepherd's care up in Pleasant Hills. Miss Clara, she was tough. Do you all know Miss Clara? Whew, man, she dropped the hammer on me more than one time. And I was grown. <laughs> she was tough. But she taught those kids the scripture, man. I mean, she taught those kids the scripture. And I'll never forget, we went up there for one of those programs one night. And our kids knew this verse. And it was, your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion. I remember some of the devotions. Looking for some one, two, devour. That's how the kids knew the scripture. Okay. And that's how they learned it. And it was, it was neat, you know, and we still quote that crazy scripture today the, that way, you know? So this is what Paul said. Paul says, this is what Simon Peter says, be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour, resist him, standing firm in the faith, 
because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. And the God of all grace who called you to this eternal glory in Christ, after you've suffered a little while, will himself restore you, make you strong, firm, and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. Now, go over to Luke 22, and we'll start with verse 31. Pastor James contends that the disciples were a youth group. That, that sermon is fantastic. And he contends that the disciples were probably 16, 17, 18, up to maybe 25 years old. Simon Peter was probably among the oldest of the bunch, okay? But irregardless of their actual age, at this stage of the game, they're all pretty young. When we get over here to the upper room, they're all pretty young. Okay? So Jesus is speaking to a young Simon Peter here. And he says, Luke 22, verse 31, Simon, Simon, Satan's asked to sift all of you as wheat, but I've prayed for you. I prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, I need you to strengthen your brothers. But Simon Peter replied, Lord, I'm ready to go with you to prison and to death. Jesus answered, I tell you, Peter, before the rooster crows today, you're going to deny three times that you even know me. And then Jesus asked them, when I sent you without purse, bag, or sandals, did you lack anything? Nothing, they answered. And he said to them, but now if you have a purse, take it, and also a bag. If you don't have a sword, sell your cloak and buy one. It is written, as he was numbered with the transgressors. And I tell you that this must be fulfilled in me. Yes, what is written about me is reaching its fulfillment. Then the disciples said, see, Lord, here are two swords. That is enough, Jesus replied. Hmm. So what you see there is a young man who is being told, Satan has asked to sift all of you as wheat, but I've prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you've turned back, strengthen your brothers. And we know what happens. He goes through all of this. It's the worst three days of Simon Peter's life. We know that when the angels appear at the tomb, and again, they don't freelance. They only tell what they're told to say. They say to the ladies, they say, go tell the disciples and Simon Peter to meet Jesus in Galilee. Those angels, again, were not freelancing. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit told those angels, make sure Simon Peter knows he's invited too. He finally comes back. We know the whole deal from John 21, all right? So now, fast forward decades into the future. Simon Peter is no longer a young man. He's an old man. And just like it was spoken to him by Jesus in the upper room, Simon Peter now teaches those younger than him what he has been through and what they're going to go through. And he's encouraging them saying, if I made it, you can make it too. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift all of you as we. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. But I've prayed for you, Simon, for all of you, that your faith may not fail. 
And the God of all grace, who called you to this eternal glory in Christ Jesus, after you've suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. And when you've turned back, strengthen your brothers, because I've prayed for you that your faith will not fail. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. That's pretty powerful. That's pretty powerful. Simon Peter isn't asking his readers to do anything that he hadn't already experienced himself. Does that make sense? And that's the cool part about this. It's just really amazing. So that's the lesson from 1 Peter 5, 8 through 11. Let's go ahead and jump down to 2 Peter 3. Okay? 2 Peter 3. All right. What is the day of the Lord? Okay. Now, this could be one of a number of things, depending on what theological perspective you're coming from. And listen, I want to encourage you. Read whatever you want to read. I do not care which theological perspective you come from. Some of you are like, what? I do not care if you are pre-tribulation people. I do not care. I do not care. I don't care if you're mid-tribulation people. I don't care if you think the rapture and the second coming of Jesus Christ is the exact same thing. I do not care. It does not matter to me. Wherever you want to fall out theologically is your business, because I'm going to tell you right now, everybody in each of those three camps, whether the rapture occurs at the beginning of the seven years, or the rapture occurs in the middle of the three or the seven years, where the Antichrist walks into the temple, so to speak, and blows it up in Jerusalem, or whether the second coming of Christ and the rapture are the exact same, it don't matter to me. Here's what I care about. Know that Jesus is coming back and be ready. That's the biggest thing we need to care about, okay? But study those things. Learn those things. Grow in those things. Speak your peace in those things. But if you do it to divide the body of Christ, shame on you. Don't you dare do that. You can do it to talk theology, but not to divide. Whether it's pre, mid, or post-trib has no bearing on Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection to bring new life to all those who would receive him. There will not be a test when you get to heaven as to which theology you believed in, pre, mid, or post-trip. So when you're reading about the day of the Lord, it is mostly about the culmination of the kingdom of God, okay? Second Peter 3. Dear friends, this is now my second letter to you. I've written both of them as reminders to stimulate you to wholesome thinking. I want you to recall the words spoken in the past by the holy prophets and the command given by our Lord and Savior through our apostles. This morning we were reading from the book of Joel and it talked about the coming day of the Lord. Above all, you must understand that in the last days scoffers will come, scoffing and following their own evil desires. They'll say, where is this coming, he promised. Ever since our ancestors died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. But they deliberately forget that long ago, by God's words, the heavens came into being and the earth was formed out of the water and by water. By these waters also the world of that time was deluged and destroyed. By the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord's not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. I mean, that's a big scripture just there. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. I've told you many times I hated that movie when I was a kid, Thief in the Night. This shouldn't scare you. It should inspire you to go and advance the gospel. 
The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire. The earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. That day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire and the elements will melt in the heat. But in keeping with his promise, we're looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. So there, dear friends, since you're looking forward to this, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with him. Bear in mind that our Lord's patience means salvation, just as our dear brother Paul also wrote you with the wisdom that God gave him. He writes the same way in all his letters, speaking in them of these matters. His letters contain some things that are hard to understand, which ignorant and unstable people... <laughs> can't say that anymore, huh? Which ignorant and unstable people distort as they do this other scriptures to their own destruction. Therefore, dear friends, since you've been forewarned, be on your guard so that you may not be carried away by the error of the lawless and fall from your secure position. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Savior. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. So there it is. So when we look at, and this is, this is vitally important, in, in morning prayer over this last, I don't know, maybe 10 days, don't quote me on that, but I think like over these last 10 days, this is the message in the morning prayer scriptures. Verse 11, since everything will be destroyed, oh, I'm sorry, verse 13, but in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. Verse 13, but in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. So I'm going to talk about this tomorrow morning in the morning devotion. And I'll probably talk about it in morning prayer. When you look at the culmination of the kingdom, it's not bad news. It's good news. If this was horrible, why would Simon Peter say we're looking forward to it? If Revelation 1 says, take a look, he's coming on the clouds of heaven. That's not a nightmare. It's a dream. Why is that so scary? Because we're projecting the judgment that's coming on the world onto ourselves. And we've been stressing this at morning prayer. Okay, now you've now made it through the whole Bible almost. Some of you have made it through twice in the last year. When you read the Old Testament prophets, who are those prophecies to? Isn't it to the northern kingdoms that are living like a bunch of wild people? And isn't it to the tribes of Judah and Benjamin that are living in Jerusalem and around Jerusalem? God is saying to his people at that time, you have lived like a bunch of wild animals and judgment is coming on you. That's God speaking to his people in the prophecies of the Old Testament. In the major prophets, bigger book, and minor prophets, smaller books. Again, no hierarchy. No one is better than the other. It's just the message in its length, okay? Major and minor. But the message is not to the world. The message is to God's people. And he is saying, restorative justice is coming to you, and you northern tribes are going to be carried off to Assyria, and you southern tribes are going to be carried off to Babylon. And this is my judgment against you. But one day I'll bring you back. When you're reading this in 2 Peter 3, and you're reading the book of Revelation. This is God speaking through Simon, Peter, and John saying, Hey, church, you're good. Hang in there. This judgment ain't coming to you. You stay firm in the faith. Endure till the end. And yes, the persecution that's going to come upon you will be painful and there will be suffering. But that is being inflicted upon you by the world. This isn't the judgment of God upon you. It's not like the people of old. You are strong. You are preserved in the faith 
and you will hold in life when the kingdom culminates. The stuff that's burning up is the stuff that's on the outside of the kingdom of God. So we should not be fearful of any of this. We should be looking forward to all of this. And when we are faced with persecution, I don't want you to think that you're going to be ill-equipped. Whatever persecution that we face, we'll be able to endure it because God will give us the strength to endure it. That is very different than the judgment that's coming upon the world, which the world is unprepared for. Now, should we sit back and say, ha, finally, the bad guys are going to get it in the end? No. What happened to the Great Commission? It still exists until the culmination of the kingdom of God. We've got to go out there and make disciples baptizing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's why we're doing what we're doing. Again, it's like I said last week or the week before, the ship of the world has a massive hole in the side of it. And everybody on the ship's going, ah, it's good, it's totally fine, it's going to be fine. It's not fine. We got the lifeboat. Let's offload the ship. Until Jesus comes back, part of our preparedness for his return is out there spreading the gospel of Christ. Don't worry about it for us. It's going to be fine. This is about a king and his coming kingdom. Let's offload the ship. Does that all make sense? I can tell you, thief in the night was not taught to me that way when I was four years old. I was peeing my pants. I was so afraid. Like when you wake up the next morning and you're happy Jesus didn't come back, that ain't a good thing. But my mother said, that's what I said when I woke up the next morning. I said, oh, thank God he didn't come. Like, who says that? You want to scare a four-year-old that much? Man, that ain't right, man. That is bad. That is bad. <laughs> that's terrible. All right. First John 2, 15 to 17. This was the lesson for today. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. John says, do not love the world or anything in the world. Those of you on Facebook, I'm on 1 John 2, 15 to 17. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, here it is, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. My point in the devotional for today, I think it was today. Um, my point in the devotional for today is, okay, watch this, okay? The enemy is very cunning, but not very creative. It's been the same three temptations from the beginning of time. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, good for food, lust of the flesh, pleasing to the eye, lust of the eyes, and desirable to make one wise, pride of life. She took an ate and gave to her husband with her. Jesus, lust of the flesh. Phew, buddy, you look hungry. You're the son of God, aren't you? I want you to turn them stones to bread, lust of the flesh. Then he showed him all the kingdoms of the world, lust of the eyes. Pride of life, if you are who you say you are, Jump off this building. Let the whole world see it. You don't have to go to that nasty old cross. Just jump off the temple. The angels of God will swoop down and save you. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. It's the same three temptations. The enemy is cunning, but not creative. So in your life, that's where you have to look. What is enticing my flesh? Walk away. What is drawing my eyes away from God? and to something else, walk away. Where am I getting the glory rather than giving the glory? Walk away. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. Make sense? Okay. Second John. Okay. Second John. Super quick. Four through 11. Okay. Second John, four through 11. It has given me great joy to find some of your children walking in the truth, just as the Father commanded us. 
And now, dear lady, I'm not writing you a new command, but one we've had from the beginning. I ask that we love one another. And this is love. Okay, so here's your definition. And this is love, that we walk in obedience to his commands. As we rest in the grace of God, then works flow through us. Love flows through. I was talking to a person here recently whose family was coming down upon them. And I said, you know the single greatest thing you can tell your family when they're coming down on you like that, making fun of you for your faith? I said, just tell them you love them and mean it. I said, to tell somebody you love them when they're awful to you and you mean it, single greatest weapon there is. You can do whatever you want to me, but I love you. I love you. I love you with all my heart. That's powerful, man. That's powerful. To resist love like that, whew, my goodness. As you've heard from the beginning, his command is that you walk in love. I say this because many deceivers who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh have gone out into the world. Any such person is a deceiver in the Antichrist. Watch out that you do not lose what we've worked for, but that you may be rewarded fully. Anyone who runs ahead and does not continue in the teaching of Christ doesn't have God. Whoever continues in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not take them into your house or welcome them. Anyone who welcomes them shares in their wicked work. I have much to write to you, but I don't want to use paper and ink. Instead, I hope to visit you and talk with you face to face so that our joy may be complete. I love the fact that John is writing to this woman and saying to her, just stay the course. You know what is true and what is not true. And what is true and always proves to be true is genuine love. If they hate you and you love them, love is proven. If people that are your family and your friends are extending love to you and you love them back, that's true. It's true. See, love just needs to flow and flow and flow. And I love the fact that he encourages her in all of that. Okay? Two more things. Third John, and then um, uh, we'll look at Jude just real quick. All right? Third John verses 9 and 10. Too often this is the case. John writes in this letter, I wrote to the church, but Diotrephes, who loves to be first, <laughs> will not welcome us. So when I come, I will call attention to what he's doing, spreading malicious nonsense about us. Not as satisfied with that, he even refuses to welcome other believers. He also stops those who want to do so and puts them out of the church. Arrogance is a horrendous, horrendous thing, okay? And then finally, Jude 9, we'll look at the ninth verse and then 17 to 22, we'll call it a night. I talked about this a little bit on Sunday morning. So this is weird, this ninth verse of, of Jude. Okay, it's, it's only one chapter. This ninth verse, when Moses died, there was a battle apparently by the archangel Michael and Satan over Moses' body. Now, there's lots of theories about this. You know, when you see um, bodies lying in state, this is what many theologians think that Satan was going to do, that they were going to produce this body. Surely there were people there that were trained in mummification arts of Egypt, they would have mummified Moses' body and used his body as an idol. That's what many people believe. Now, does it say that? No. But Satan was going to do something with Moses' body. And Michael and Satan are battling over it. Verse 9. But even the archangel Michael, when he was disputing with the devil about the body of Moses, did not himself dare condemn him for slander, but said... The Lord rebuke you. 
And I talked about this on Sunday, just saying that when we get in these situations, we don't need to get into a back and forth with the enemy. It's as simple as just saying, the Lord rebuke you. I don't have to dance the dance with the devil. I'm going to stand with the Lord. Then this, a call to persevere, verses 17 to 22. And we'll close with this. But dear friends, remember what the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ foretold. This is on uh, Facebook. This is uh, Jude 17 to 22. But dear friends, remember what the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ foretold. They said to you, in the last times, there'll be scoffers who will follow their own ungodly desires. These are the people who divide you, who follow mere natural instincts and do not have the spirit. But you, dear friends, by building yourselves up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keeping yourself in God's love as you wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you to eternal life. Be merciful to those who doubt. Save others by snatching them from the fire. Some people you got to go after. And to others, show mercy, mixed with fear, hating even the clothing stained by the corrupted flesh. I hope what you're hearing is, is these writers saying, hang in there, hang in there. Don't weary of doing good. There's always something that we can just move on and move on and move on within. And there's more people to bring in and bring in and bring in. And as long as the church is faithful, then we're going to see it grow. So that's our message for tonight. There you go. Next week, Revelation. Like I said, if we get to a point where I need to be at the hospital, I'll see that they send out a message but I'm 99.9999% sure I will be here next, um, next, uh, um, yes, I know, I know. So anyways, so let me close with a word of prayer and we'll move on down the road. Well, Father, thank you for this this evening. Thank you that we get to share with these folks. Thank you that we get to learn so much scripture week after week after week. And I know, Lord God, there's a million other things that we can learn. But it's been so good. I can't believe we're down to one week. It's just amazing, God. So as people begin to work through the book of Revelation starting tomorrow, slow and steady wins the race. And I say this, Lord, in the devotional tomorrow. Let's let the poetry of Revelation be poetry. And let's let the math of Revelation be be math. And let's not mix the two. The imagery that you give, Lord God, let it be imagery that leads us to truth. And the math of this, the linear theology of the book of Revelation, let it also stay what it is. And let's not try to fluff it up and zhuzh it up. Let's let it stay as it is. So God, thank you so much for these people and their dedication to work the way, all the way, through the Scripture. God, we love you. We give you praise. It's in your precious name that we pray, Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, guys. God bless you online. God bless you. Uh, those of you that are asking what time does Bible study start, starts every Wednesday at 6.30, except we only have one Wednesday left. So, <laughs> and we'll start again at the beginning of the year. God bless you guys. All right. See you nice WebEx people.